Can we just move this water though? Sure. All right, well, I'm really excited to get to talk with you about uh, one of my favorite topics today, which is disability identity development. Um, as we get started, I'm gonna first talk a little bit about um, some of my own story and how, and how I've come to, come to sit here in front of you all um, to talk about this particular topic, and I'm getting tangled in all these cords, so there we go. Um, I, as, as was said, I am on faculty in the, de in the Department of Human and Organizational Development, as well as the Department of Special Education at Vanderbilt University. Um, and for me, also, I you're going to hear a little bit about some of my, about some of my personal story. So I acquired transverse myelitis when I was just four and a half months old. So I was born in, in, in Calcutta, India, and was adopted and came to the United States at two and a half months of age. And then it was two months after being in the United States that I, that I got transverse myelitis. Back in 1984, there weren't a lot of these therapies and treatments and, um, and all of this, the, the, the types of um, steroid treatments and medicines and just uh, technological advances that exist today. A fun fact is that I was actually the first um, baby to receive an MRI at Mass General Hospital back in 1984. And so um, at, in that time period, you know, this was, this was such a rare, and I mean, it's still rare, right? But it was even, it was even more rare back in 1984. And, and so it's just amazing to me to be at an event like this and to, and to hear all of your different stories. Being so young when I acquired my disability, I actually held this, this naive childhood assumption. I actually thought that everyone in the whole world had a disability and that this was just a phase that I was one day going to outgrow. And when I, when I peel that onion back in terms of what that assumption meant for me and what that meant, in, especially in relation to my identity, which is our topic here today, I actually believed in order to go to college, in order to get a job, in order to have a family, in order to do these things that we aspire to, I thought that I had to be able to walk. I thought that I had to be non-disabled in order to do those different things. And boy, was I a little bit wrong with that little assumption here. Um, but how did, I, how did I go from that assumption to, to what you see now? Well, I grew up in Natick, Massachusetts, which is actually on the eight mile marker of the Boston Marathon. And this was a life-changing experience for me, watching individuals in racing wheelchairs go flying by, going 25, 26 miles per hour, and I was blown away. First of all, it was really cool, and I really wanted to try it, but it was also the, the, uh, the realization that these individuals had disabilities. A lot of them were wearing their college and university colors, or they were representing their country doing this particular race. And this was so monumental for me as a young kid that I actually started dressing up on Halloween as the winner of the Boston Marathon. <laughs> it became that favorite recurring costume. And it was so profound to give me that power of a role model and to be able to see that I could grow up to be an adult, as simple as that may sound. So this picture here, the one on the left, is actually a drawing that I made during a third grade project of me winning the Boston Marathon. Um, I did have the incredible opportunity to go on to college at the University of Illinois, which is one of two college uh, programs, yeah, Illini, um, which is one of two college programs that offers collegiate level wheelchair racing. And this led to an incredible career, not only representing, um, representing my college and university, but then being able to go on to Team USA and representing our country um, in both the Beijing and 2012 Paralympic Games. Um, I did have the awesome experience as well um, in 2010 of actually qualifying for the, uh, to, to, to compete in the Boston Marathon. So I was, a, I, I was a sprinter, so for a sprinter to qualify and hit a qualifying time for Boston was, was pretty exciting, but especially because of that connection to my identity. So it, I feel like I was really able to come full circle in terms of that. So this was, you know, this is one sort of rosy picture in terms of, an, of identity development. And I could just stop the story there and say, see you later, have a nice day. But I want to talk a little bit more about the, the flip side of that. So, so there's, there's those positive aspects, the sense of community that I got from being involved in sport, that strong sense of self that came from this. But it was all, there was also hardships and struggles. I encountered, unfortunately, quite a lot of inaccessibility in my school district. 
Um, I was involved in a federal lawsuit against my school district on discrimination on the basis of disability. And so this was a news clipping from the Boston Globe at the time period where I was a 14 year old who sat my parents down at the dinner table and said, mom, dad, I've hired myself a lawyer. You can support me if you want. You don't have to, but this is what I'm doing and here's why. And the here's why was the fact that I was uh, banned from participating in phys ed class from the fifth grade on because I was a danger to the other students. It was the fact that my um, English teacher had to relocate my class to the ground floor and was taking role that first day of class my sophomore year and got to my name and said, what are you doing in an honors level English class? It's not like you can go to college anyway. It was things like that, that let, and this culminating effect of unfortunate educators and, and, and folks like that that led to my deciding to really take an, a huge advocacy step for a young teenager. And thankfully, I did have the tremendous support of my parents in terms of going through this lawsuit. High school's an awkward time in terms of identity anyway, so try adding in this federal lawsuit, and it was, it was, a, it was a rough time to, uh, for sure. But all of these experiences have, led the, have laid really the foundation for my scholarly work as a professor now where I study disability identity development. So again, this, this underlying current of social justice and advocacy and, and who I am as a person, I bring all of these things to the research that I do. So in, sometimes we, we try to keep the, the, the personal out of our research, depending on the types of studies that we're doing, and I very intentionally put myself into the research because by having this lived experience of my disability, I feel that I'm one of the best, most qualified types of researchers to actually study um, disability identity development. So a little bit of background, you know, there, there's unfortunately so much out there in terms of other types of identity development. So racial identity development, LGBT identity development, religious identity development, even athletic identity development. But there's far less out there in terms of disability identity development. And it, it, yet, we know that this is a dynamic source of identity, that there's, that there's positive experiences that individuals share, and there is this benefit to having this strong sense of self that can lead to benefits in terms of, of physical health outcomes as well as psychological health outcomes. So I was saying, why aren't we looking at this from a disability perspective? So this is a working definition of disability identity. So this strong sense of self, that connection to the community, which is what, what, all, what all of us are here talking, um, talking about with, it, with this particular symposium. It's also believed that this positive sense of, of identity is able to help buff, serve as a buffer in situations like that high school English teacher that I encountered, facing inaccessibility and um, out and about in society, dealing with those social stresses and, and, and daily hassles. So what I've been doing the past five years, really, is all sorts of research related to disability identity in both adult and adolescent populations. So I'm not gonna go through every single study that we've done, but this is just to show you that this is, is becoming really a body of work that, that I'm hoping to contribute to. A few highlights from this include um, we started with um, an, uh, telling the story of college students with disabilities. And this was particularly unique because it, at the time that this data was collected, college students were the first, um, these college students rather, were the first individuals where they had the Americans with Disabilities Act that was in existence for their entire lives. So they're a part of what we call the ADA generation. So they don't remember a life without the ADA existing. They don't remember the fight that Sandy, here in the, in the room, um, had in terms of writing that legislation, in terms of passing that, and so forth. So, it's a, so it was a unique population to be able to ask these individuals, how is it that they were constructing this sense of identity and what this means for them? Um, from this particular study, and we're going to see um, this theme in, in a few other pieces that I talk about, there was four developmental statuses that emerged, and, and these were acceptance, relationship, which is really relationship building, um, adoption, which is adopting values of that core group, and engagement. So here are exactly what I was just saying of those particular things. So 
to talk through a little bit more of what, this, what these statuses really mean. Um, so acceptance, I think it's really important to note that acceptance isn't always a positive. So what we found from this work is that yes, there may be positive elements of acceptance, but there's also this internal processing in related to frustration and anger, and that that's okay. And, and so again, I think that's a nuance that being a researcher with a disability, that I'm able to name that frustration and anger, I think in ways that many non-disabled researchers tend to shy away from or aren't able to appropriately really dive into what that means. Um, another aspect of acceptance is how is it that friends and family members and, and close friends rather, um, interact or treat the individual with the disability, whether that's similar to or different to the non-disabled people within, within their lives. Um, the relationship status here, this is the connection or bond. So how is it that, you, that an individual relates to or does not relate to other people with disabilities? I have so many questions about this particular one of does, is there a nuance of it being the same disability group or is it just disability in general? And how does, the, how does that look like across the lifespan? What does that mean when you might have multiple disability diagnoses? How do you, if you have a hidden disability, how do you get to the point of that disclosure to know that you might have this connection or bond with someone to develop that relationship? So it's a complicated, it's definitely a complicated piece. Um, the adoption status, so this is really um, once you've learned kind of the ways of the group by being engaged in the, in the relationship with the disability community, then it's, gee, you know, I think I want to try those values on for size and have them be a part of who I am. And that's really adoption and, and really starting to grow that bond or that connection to this broader disability community. And then we've got the engagement status. So engagement, this can take on many different forms in terms of forms of service, in terms of uh, forms of activism and advocacy, like I was talking about in terms of my own lawsuits. Oh, and there we go. Um, I don't know what happened there. Um, and and this, this type of, of engagement can also be things like fundraising, serving on boards or panels, public speaking and sharing your, sharing your story. It can also, it doesn't have to be frontward facing service. It can also be things like engagement in online communities, writing blogs. We have very active um, members from the disability community who engage on social media platforms. So I think that's important to think, to think about it and how, how it is that we define engagement can really vary. Um, so back to the research, we then looked at what research actually exists related to this concept of disability identity development. And there, from, um, from doing this literature search, there were only 41 empirical studies, meaning there were only 41 studies that actually asked people with disabilities about disability identity development. So a lot of the other studies were, pe were people kind of musing and thinking about it, but they didn't actually include participants or engage, whether that was through surveys or, um, or interviews or things like that. So I think that that's a really telling, um, telling finding. The other part was that only nine of these 41 studies had more than 100 participants. So when we talk about, you know, in research wanting to have larger sample sizes and to really be able to get a sense of this complex phenomenon, we are way behind in terms of disability identity. And that's really what we, what we learned. Um, the other piece is that what, from this work, I learned that we, in, from my perspective, I would love to be able to include a measure of a person's disability identity in a lot of these other studies that we've heard about throughout this weekend. So if you're assessing a person based on their fatigue level or their pain level or how it is that they're, that they're, what they're how they perceive their quality of life or their, or their agency, I would like to be able to include a measure on a person's disability identity. Interestingly, or maybe not based on that last slide that I just said, there are not any valid uh, reliable measures out there about disability identity development. Um, so, I, and I don't know what's going on with this microphone. Does this one work if I switch to that? Um, anyway, um, so scale development is a very long process and it's really hard work, um, but we're, we're, we're trying to be able to take what I had found from those, quali from those qualitative findings and then develop survey items in order to really be able to, to not to, to really truly measure this thing called disability identity. 
So we have collected data from 566 respondents all around the United States. Um, the, we started with adults, and, um, and, and I think one other piece that's really important is that I was trying to be as inclusive as possible in terms of as many disability groups that I could, that I could have them be included in this particular study because, again, I want this to have applicability across, um, across groups. So, um, in terms of disability status, instead of really pigeonholing myself in terms of wanting to be able to get large numbers in every single possible diagnostic category that there are out there, um, I tried to th rethink of how it is that we are defining disability in terms of is it a person with a hidden disability or a non-apparent or less apparent disability or an apparent or visible disability or both. And so that way of bucketing was a little bit more uh, manageable in terms of making sure that we were getting um, uh, high enough numbers of individuals across each of these. Um, and, and, and again, this is still a work in progress here as we're, as we're working through this. These are some example items. So sometimes as I'm talking about this, people are like, well, what are you actually asking? And, the, and so these are example items and individuals are asked to respond how much that statement is not like you at all to very much like you. And so there's a sliding scale in terms of, of where you feel, where you fall based on these types of items. So, um, so, so again, really trying to pull out those elements related to that model that I was just talking about in terms of acceptance, relationships, adoption, and, and engagement. So as we shift then to what we're learning in terms of adolescent work, um, I'm very fortunate that I actually have a postdoc who's working with me, doc, Dr. Carlin Mueller, um, and part of her own dissertation work included a, an adolescent specific study that we're taking her work and, we're kind of, and now we're gonna be working together for the next three years um, to, to, really, to really do hopefully some cool things. So she started off with, very similar like me, started off with some student interviews in terms of what is it that adolescents are, are how is it that they're talking about and forming their disability identity this was part of a larger study where she also included adults um, as well. And the interesting pieces that came, that came from her work was where, where and how do children in schools develop the notions and, and con concept around disability identity. So there were some oppressive identity resources, so negative aspects of, of identity in terms of things being perpetuated, kind of similar to some of those teachers that I encountered. So peers and teachers' ideas about disability from negative ways that were being, that were being promoted and, and perpetuated within, within the school environment. Another thing that she noticed from, from these interviews was curricular silence, meaning that disability was not talked about within the curriculum. When they were having you know, a special assembly programs and things like that, disability was not on the forefront of, 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 in terms of, of, of the types of diversity of the, of the speakers that were coming in. Uh, in turn, this then led to students reporting um, experiences of loneliness as well as victimization and bullying. So that was kind of on the negative side. In terms of protective identity resources or more from the positive, like where are they finding these resources? First and foremost, it was those adult role models. So going back to me and that Boston Marathon story, those adults matter. So engaging with those adults, and but oftentimes that was from the community, outside of the school environment in terms of, so that, that burden of responsibility is on you, the person, or you, the family, to find that community. Um, social media and technology played a huge role because, again, if you're, in one, if you're a, an N of one with your disability within your school or your district or even your, your community, how do you find that, com that community? So, so technology played a, played a really big role. Um, and also participation in special education and becoming aware of your own accommodation. So I loved that from an advocacy standpoint which came from her work, which was the more that the children participated in those IEP and 504 meetings themselves, then they became more confident in talking about their disability to others. And so this was then viewed as a positive sense of self as they're developing it. So students um, are, are unfortunately not often talking about disability as a positive and, and again, don't really have access to a lot of the, the, that disability cultural resources that adults are able to, to frame that identity. So 
for students in schools, they really often think of disability only in the context of whatever their accommodations or modifications are. They think of disability only in the terms of that, that's written in their IEP or their 504 plan. Um, but we, what we're hoping to find is that, is that we can be more creative with online spaces, with community spaces, and to expose children to what else, um, what else is out there. So building on that, I then started doing a study last summer with um, youth uh, with disabilities, middle school and high school age youth, um, to go to do uh, interviews as well. And so we have done 24 interviews, and interestingly, I think five are from our community. So e with any of any of our of our conditions that that fall under SNRA, um, five of them actually, thanks to the to the TMA for for blasting my my study recruitment, uh, were able to participate. And what we're finding, very similar to what Dr. Mueller found, is that, that you know, adults, I mean, sorry, adolescents are still very much grappling with their identity and their disability identity, which is to be expected. Um, and, but they're also drawing from very similar sources. There's, there's the negative sides in terms of coming from teachers and peers, just like what Dr. Mueller found. We also found a lot more um, individuals who are willing to talk more about facing discrimination, which, was, which I thought was particularly interesting. In terms of protective resources, those, re those relationships and connection to the outside community was very important. Um, we also found, oops, and, and I think it got cut off there on this particular slide, but oh, there it is, sports-based. So in this particular sample, so many individuals pointed to the fact that they were involved in some type of adaptive sport and that was where they met other people like them. And so that was when they were able to then formulate their identity and, and kind of um, have that grow for them. So the next steps for me um, are that I am really working to f finish this validation of, the, of an adult scale on disability identity. We will soon, in the next coming months, be soliciting for responses from a new adult sample to finalize this process. So please be on the lookout when that message comes, comes out. Um, and, and you know, what, we, what we're then gonna do is, go, is combine that data from this new sample with those 566 that I was sharing with you to start to answer some exciting questions of what are, are, are there differences in terms of a person's disability identity based on the like length of time since onset? Are there differences from, from my perspective of, be, of having an apparent versus a less apparent disability? A single versus multiple disabilities? I'd be really curious in terms of recurrence of disability um, and recurring events that, that some of us in, in this community um, ha, um, face. Um, I'm really interested to then be able to take that information to help us to better design interventions and to better time those interventions. So going back to what I said uh, several slides ago in terms of that frustration and anger, if we know where a person is at in terms of their developmental trajectory of, of embracing or not embracing their disability identity, is there a way that we can figure out what that sweet spot might be to talk about potential adaptive sport resources or the community resources. Because if you go in when somebody's already angry and frustrated, they might just shut you out entirely. And some of you maybe had that experience yourself. And so I hope that this will then empower our clinicians and our doctors and our therapists and so forth to be able to, um, to, to, to have a stronger sense of where we're at in terms of that disability identity process. Um, we are continuing then to, to then um, also develop a youth survey related to youth disability identity. Because of that age factor, I'm not gonna make the assumption that a youth uh, making meaning around their disability identity is the same as adults. I think that would be fundamentally flawed. So we wanna go back to the drawing board in terms of how is it that youth are making meaning around this. I'm also very interested in what is the process that parents and caregivers go through as well as siblings. And this is probably five, 10 years down the line because I've got my plate a little bit full with these other things that I'm just sharing here. But I'm very interested in that because I believe that, that parents and caregivers and siblings, um, they, they have more disability knowledge and, and some type of disability identity. It might not be the same as having the disability or the condition that, 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 we, that we have, but it's, I believe that, it, that they have more awareness and more knowledge than like the average Joe on the street. So I'd be very curious to, to start to look at, at, to look at that. Um, so 
a few kind of just closing remarks in terms of conclusions here of what, what it is that we're, that we're trying to do. I would like to encourage all of us to think about activities and ways in which we can explore and just talk about disability identity, whether that's in school settings, whether that's in work settings, whether that's just, you know, as we're having, engaging in these conversations of, hey, well, you know, how, how you're doing in terms of things going well or not well, you know, have it be a part of that conversation. Um, I have one article where, where we've actually developed some different exercises um, to, to help to facilitate conversations around disability identity. And so one of them for older individuals is this one, and I know you can't see it, but we'll, we'll make sure you get, all the, get this. Um, so this is a who am I activity. And so this can be used with individuals with or without disabilities in order to see where on this list, as you, just, as you identify attributes and characteristics about you, where, if at all, does disability fall on this list? And so that's what the second page is kind of some processing questions of where, where on the list or if at all did disability appear? Would you miss that, I, I, that identity if it, would, if it had been taken away? Um, and so forth. And so uh, again, it, it's being able to, to then have this be a conversation starter to think critically about disability and, and disability identity. Another activity is a very simple one that anyone can, can participate, which is where on this sheet of paper and, um, would you mark an X representing your disability identity on this page? And for some individuals, you know, that, that X goes inside that, that black circle. For some individuals, it's right on the line. For some individuals, it's outside of the circle. And again, it's just meant to be a conversation starter in terms of where is it that, the, that you're thinking of your disability identity and how might that change and shift over time um, depending, on, depending on what your role is. So again, how you respond to this activity is gonna be different in my perspective if you have a disability versus if you're a parent or a caregiver or a sibling or a professional working with individuals with, within this population. And so again, I'm all about having these conversation starters to be able to, to start to talk about, uh, about this work. Um, and, and you know, in conclusion, I think that for me personally, when I think about the stronger together, that's really what this is all about, and that's really what the, the lens that I've really tried to take with this particular work is that, yes, I have, I, I really very much want to get a sense of what does disability identity mean for our community, but I also see this across this much larger picture of the broader disability community and how we can learn from one another in terms of, in terms of processing and making, making meaning around this identity. So with that, thank you very much, and please reach out if there's any questions.